this is a courtesy announcement that this meeting is now being broadcast live on the internet. Hi, Megan, can we do a mic check, please? How's that sound? Sounds good, thank you very much. Okay. Hi, Kathy. Can we do a mic check, please? Yes. Hello. This is Kathy. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hello, Hui. Can we do a mic check, please? I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Hello, Supervisor Chavez, how are you? I'm good, how are you doing, Dave? I'm well, thank you, happy Friday. Yay, thank you. Yes, we'll be clerking for you this afternoon. Excellent, thanks a bunch. Hui, it's good to see you. It's like my favorite hat. That's how everybody recognizes me now. <laughs> I know now that we're all unmasked in public, it's, it's hard to yeah, well, you know, with the mask on, uh, I think the only way people knew me was my hat. <laughs> Good afternoon, all. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm, I just want to let everyone know I'm Megan Sweezy Fogarty. I'm sitting in for Martin Shell today from Stanford. Oh, great. Welcome. Nice to see you. Hello, everyone. Cindy, I just was at the opening of the alcove in Palo Alto, and I know there's the second opening today. So exciting. Thank you for your leadership. Oh my goodness. It, we borrowed a great idea from you. I'm really excited. Recording in progress. It. Really, really excited. And this is a, um, just to share with our colleagues, this is a, 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 a really unique idea about helping young people um, engage in their own mental health and really how to pr protect themselves and um, get the services they need without the stigma. It's really exciting. And so one a location in partnership with Stanford and um, yeah, I forgot Al with Alcove, Megan, what's the nonprofit partner in, um, in North County? It's the Center for Mental Health and Wellbeing at, the, at Stanford Healthcare. And then Alam Rock Counseling Center is the other, right? So yeah, yeah and Alam Rock Counseling Center is our partner here um, in downtown uh, San Jose, which is really exciting. Yeah. yeah. And it's very youth led. So um, that was the joy of it is, I'm sure it'll be the same in the San Jose opening, but the, the youth running the program today and helping cut the ri ri ribbon and everything was very exciting. Yeah, and they'll be giving a tour here in just a little bit in San Jose. So at the end of this meeting, actually. So, um, so as people join on, let me just talk through our agenda. We have a, a couple of meaty items today. And um, so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna call our meeting to order. And I'm gonna ask um, if, the, if our clerk can take role. And just as a reminder, everybody's a member of the board. We have a subset of members that um, help us create quorum. So with that, if I could ask, uh, call our meeting to order for the Hate Crimes Task Force of June 25th. And with that, I'll ask for the roll to be called. Um, Chairperson, as I'm scanning our list, we are still one short of quorum. Okay. Well, then we'll, like 
Yeah, we'll go to public comment and then we'll come back if that's okay. all right with my colleagues. All right, great. How many minutes would you like? Uh, we'll have two minutes for each uh, speaker that's speaking under public comment. Okay. Just one moment for the timer. And our first speaker will be Scott Largent. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Scott Largent. Yesterday, I was out at uh, the crash zone uh, meeting with uh, several people from the media and just trying to discuss the situation out there so the public can better understand what's going on. Uh, the city of San Jose, now, now I know that this needs to be cleaned up and organized. That's not what I'm fighting against. Um, they came out there, and this is at the direction of the city, and they brought um, Tucker Construction out there. Um, you know, they had bolt cutters and a couple of the other uh, uh, incompetent employees. One had a machete on his side. Now I know these are just like what they would consider like having tools on them or something, but it just comes across wrong because when you don't see something that says city of San Jose or our county, and you see just this Tucker construction, somebody with a vest and a jacket, minimum wager, um, that person coming knocking on your door, you're going to be a little concerned. It could get pretty ugly out there. Um, you know, down in um, Los Angeles right now at Venice Beach, the Sheriff's Department has gotten involved. And I'm monitoring that um, through several other like kind of YouTube activists and stuff that are, you know, kind of on the, you know, boots on the ground. And I really like what's going on. I like the fact that they're really getting out there and talking with the homeless, the mentally ill, the vendors, and really figuring out what people need. And they're bringing out a lot of different services from getting people haircuts to changing tires to get them new tents to you know, a lot of different things. And they're showing progress. They're showing the community coming together. And law enforcement was at odds, but now you see LAPD and the Sheriff's Department working together. Now they finally gotten out all their behavioral health people. And it's truly what the community needs. Um, down there right now, it is literally Lord of the Flies and everybody is mixed in one big mop bucket. You guys could get on this and start really pulling people out of there. There are good people, there are bad people. So um, let's figure this out, please. That concludes our request to speak. We do have quorum present at this time. If you are unmuted. Excellent, thank you. Would you mind taking the role? Of course. Co-chairperson Chavez? Here. Co-chairperson Esparza? Here. Here. Member mm -hmm. Lee? Present. Member Boyarski? Yeah, I, there are some towards. Apologies. Member Boyarski? Present. Thank you. Member Lori Smith? Present. Thank you. Member O'Neill? David Epps for Molly O'Neill. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, your presence won't be counted towards quorum, um, but we'll note that you're here. And Member Jeff Smith? Member Jeff here. Smith, thank I, you. I'm here, sorry. Thanks very much, no problem. Member Narayan? Here. Thank you, member No. Present. Thank you. Member Washburn? Absent. Member Dewan? Here. Thank you, member Armaline? Absent, member Appel? Here. Thank you. Member Yeager? Here. Thank you. Member Estramera? Here. Thank you. Member Elginati. Apologies. I, I should practice this every time. Here. Thank you. Member Conda. Present. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, we're now going to move on to item three, and this is to receive a report relating to alternative names for the hate crimes task force and forward a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. And at our first meeting, you may recall that some of our members shared that the current name of the task force gives the impression that our work is limited to hate crimes and not the overall work of combating hate climate. A few task force members volunteered to put forward an alternative name for your consideration. 
And I'd like to thank uh, Mikael, uh, Kathy, and Maha for taking this on. And I'm going to turn it over to them for a presentation and then uh, back to you all for a discussion. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez, and thank you, Madam Chair, for entertaining this discussion. Um, I um, raised the issue principally because I wanted, as the Supervisor said, um, the name to better reflect the stakeholders um, and to, to better reflect the work, the breadth of the work that everyone is proposing. Um, so Supervisor Chavez put together a little subgroup, member um, Kathy Wong and member Maha El Ganadi and I uh, all discussed um, potential alternative names and in doing so we centered the discussion around the presentations that everyone provided um, so that it could reflect the variety again of stakeholders and specifically the work that they proposed. We put together a very very short PowerPoint that summarizes the bullet points of that discussion and ultimately we do make a proposal for an alternative name but I want to emphasize we're not married necessarily to the language um, and I would encourage everyone to, to, um, to provide input if they'd like to uh, propose an alternative to the alternative, and then hopefully we can make an efficient decision. So I think I have the right to share my screen. I'm going to give that a shot. And then um, uh, um, Dr. Wong and Maha, if you would like to jump in um, at any time, please do so. Um, so this is, can everyone see that? Is there any? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so the rationale is here in order for uh, us to change the climate in Santa Clara County, we need to be inclusive. And that means business, law enforcement, community organizations, education sector, nonprofit sector, and governmental agencies. So the issues and the solutions need to be centered beyond uh, crime and punishment, essentially. When we heard the presentations, during our regular session meeting, um, what we saw were a, a, a set of three principal themes in the, the way that, that the different groups propose that we address or prevent uh, hate incidents. Um, and, and one of them was prevention, one of them was education, and one of them was raising awareness. Uh, and again, the import of that is that we want the name to reflect that the work we're doing is around policy and not solely around uh, punishment, which is what you think of when you think of crimes. Um, and, and, it, and I think it also communicates to um, those who hear the name, the work that needs to be done, that it needs to be beyond solely uh, crime and punishment. Um, Dr. Wong or, or Maha, did you want to jump in at all? Could I, um, could I jump in? Is that okay? All right. Please, so, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Mika. So, so one of the, um, you know, just to reiterate what uh, Mika said, I think that a lot of times we, when we think of hate crimes and we think of criminality, it, it sets a very um, high bar for something to be de determined to be something problematic or something that the county should, should, or all of us should act on. And so part of it is, is languaging, but it's also language, you know, expands the ways in which we see. We have much higher standards. I know from the presentations as well as, well as the conversations and all of our connections in our community that we know that a lot of the low level things are the things that are the hardest to deal with. And they can't be in some ways policy away, but they can be, um, you know, uh, there can be initiatives that are effective in addressing those things. And so we thought that the language would really expand um, the, the recommendations as well as what people might um, research or bring into that are relevant um, across different, a broad swath of community organizations, as well as neighborhood groups and, and other groups, so. Yeah, this is Maha, and I just wanted to say that I have really nothing to add. Everything has been exactly on point. Thank you both. Um, turning back to the uh, PowerPoint, the emphasis from the community organizations and the presentations are here, com cultural competency training, uh, institutional um, progress. Institutions in general need to learn more about the communities they're serving, uh, community trust at the institutional level. Uh, specifically put public institutions is a key component and um, collaborative work on understanding the, the climate is is key for uh, for prevention and finally the issues are um, far more complex than uh, kind of 
uh, the end of the line when um, well, what, what we see is is the worst type of incident, which is a hate crime. Um, In-group and intergroup horizontal implicit bias issues between different groups. Um, and one of the goals, of course, is transforming the climate, uh, really a paradigm shift uh, that, that, again, addresses early prevention and microaggressions and, and those critical components at the beginning of the spectrum so that, that, um, that we could be more effective from a preventative perspective. Um, so transforming climate and building community and public organizational capacity for engaged responsibility is key and promotion of a climate of inclusion and social accountability. Um, so again, this emphasizes, as Dr. Wong was saying, um, the type of work um, that we need to focus on and what we need to communicate about the breadth of solutions that are uh, important here. So this is the last slide. This is um, really the top three names that we distilled out. Um, and they are conceitedly a little bit wordy, uh, but again, um, our goal was to best reflect what we were seeing, for, or, or, or I'm sorry, what we were hearing uh, from the presentations in the community. And so the, the top proposed name was a task force on multi-sector approaches to hate prevention. Um, and the multi-sector is really the key language there because we see these incidents happening um, mostly in businesses. Um, and so we're talking a lot about public institutions, education, um, and 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 all of these um, all of these sectors need to be included uh, in our uh, in the way we identify ourselves. Uh, two other proposed names that were thrown out there are, are the task force on inclusion and anti hate policy, and third is the task force on policy and practices on hate prevention and hate crimes. Um, so, if anybody wants to say that third one three or four times quickly, that would be entertaining. Um, but um, that's that's really the hit list. That's the presentation. Um, back to regular screen. And uh, with that, what I, I'd like to I guess I'd like to turn it over to Supervisor Chavez to um, to moderate a broader discussion about a decision. But our proposed name is the uh, Task Force on Multi-Sector Approaches to uh, Hate Prevention. So um, before we go into the discussion, I would like to propose how we can um, proceed relative to this item. So first of all, anyone who wants to weigh in, of course, we want to hear feedback and you can ask questions of the committee. Uh, you know, that that would be great for this item to move forward. What we're going to work on is getting to consensus. And what I'd like to do is, um, Kavita, I'm going to turn this over to you uh, to just share a little bit about how we can how we can make this happen. And then I'll come to all of you for a, for feedback. Yep, absolutely. And I'm on vacation right now at my parents' house. So is everybody able to hear me okay? I've never yes. used the internet here before. Okay, great. Uh, so, all right, so getting to a consensus on an item like this, we obviously have a, a large body with a large number of voting members. And um, due to Brown Act rules, we do need to have a full roll call vote for every single item other than the um, just in, in, uh, informational items where each of the voting members says yay or nay to the item. And so uh, we can't have a consensus vote in sort of a common sense fashion where we might say, does everyone agree? And anyone who doesn't should speak up and then take silence to mean that we have full consensus. Um, but one nice way to, to ensure that we're reaching consensus in a setting where we do have to go through the formality of the roll call vote is to ensure that everybody has a chance to weigh in verbally with their thoughts, their feedback, their comments before we take the roll call vote with the goal of getting to unanimity or at least even if everyone doesn't feel like they got their absolute first choice name, um, they can still live with the outcome and they feel buy-in and approval of the process and the final result. So um, depending on what you would prefer, Supervisor Chavez, uh, you could go around and ask each member to share their thoughts, either by calling on people one by one or simply have an open forum as a way to build consensus and then following that discussion to have the formal roll call vote. Thank you. So what I'm going to what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to ask folks um, who would like to weigh in on this just to raise their electric hand and um, and then based on feedback, we can take some action and I'll just share with you that for folks who feel strongly about this one way or another, please weigh in. Um, 
early. <laughs> and I want to just re reinforce that the stated name, uh, Mika, the, um, the preference that you all had was the multi-sectoral, the, the, uh, they're all long, but the one with the multi-sectoral um, name in it is, was the most significant. And that was by unanimity from your committee, right? That's correct. Yeah? Okay, yeah. great. All right, so um, I'm going to start with um, Susan and then go to Greg and then to Otto. Um, thank you. Um, I'm not really sure about the name, but what I wanted to do was raise uh, kind of uh, the um, overall tone of what the name should be. And I think that it should include an acknowledgement of underlying causes. I think that historically, we know that when uh, people are hurting in the population and when there's, we're in a period of very exaggerated income and wealth uh, disparity, and uh, there are so many people who are homeless and people who are not receiving services that they need. And in a time like this, it's very easy to agitate people into hating other groups of people. And I think that uh, just uh, training people on cultural competency and educating people about why they shouldn't hate doesn't really address underlying causes that, that create the atmosphere for hate. So that's, that's my comment. Thank you. Greg? I, um, I think it is a good idea to change the name. Uh, I think simply saying hate crimes is, um, is not inclusive enough. It doesn't, doesn't uh, necessarily imply, imply prevention looking at the causes and so forth. I, I also think it would be a mistake to um, simply talk about uh, hate prevention because that does not include the, 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 the criminal enforcement uh, uh, part, which is important also. So I think something like the, the second um, suggestion, tax force at inclusion and anti-hate policy is broad enough that it would include both. Okay. Uh, thanks, Greg. Otto? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So um, the uh, thing about naming, uh, let's just a little background. My background is an uh, IP lawyer, and, and one thing I work with is help companies uh, do namings and come brand names. And one of the most important things I've learned is that less is more. And what I mean by that is, the more words that don't sorry, make the group any stronger and people understand it is actually more complicated. So um, I, I, the current name of you know, Hate Crime Task Force is short, uh, but it's a bit too narrow because it's talking about crimes. Obviously, we're talking about incidents and inclusion and those issues. So I would say some things shorter uh, would be my, my suggestion of group, like, for example, uh, Hate Prevention Task Force or Inclusion and Hate Prevention. But once you start getting into words like multi-sector approaches, I know what you're trying to do and say, but I think it actually loses the meaning for those who are working on it in the future, uh, what we're doing. So trying to keep this as broad as possible and short as possible, I would suggest that would be a good approach. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Michelle? Um, thank you. Uh, for the work that's gone into this, for me, when you start talking about a multi-sector approach, I feel that we lose people in that discussion. And while I realize it represents both, if understanding of language can be interpretive in a way that we're missing the people of Santa Clara County in helping us on this task force. So I think I lean more towards the second one as well, just because of it's a little shorter, it, it in, it's more inclusive, um, you know, and, and we are nothing in our representation of the communities we serve if we're also not representing those communities. Thank you. Lori? So the, the one comment that I have um, is the word crime. I would want to make sure that it's all incidents because the hate crime is just such a high bar sometimes. And we're looking at all incidents of hate. So if you're going to construct something, at least keep that type of thing in mind that we want to um, be more inclusive in types of incidents. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Are there other thoughts or comments? Ah, Fawn, Chief No. I would concur with some of the comments that, you know, whatever we change it to, that we keep it short. 
Um, I know that we want to cover as many things uh, as possible, but I think what's more important is that the goals and objectives that we have set, you know, for this um, task force here, which is really important when people drill down on what sort of work that we're doing. And we're not gonna be able to cover everything that we want to work on in um, naming a task force. And I think if we make it too long, we'll lose its uh, sort of like intention on grabbing people's attention because uh, most of the movements uh, in, in history and recently are really simple. Uh, you know, let's take Black Lives Matter, for example. I think it's uh, three words, but we know that there's a lot of work to be done, you know, uh, within those three words. And so I think most people understand, you know, when we're talking about hate, you know, and so when we try to add too many words in there, to try to be inclusive, I think we would lose sort of like uh, the the focus, uh, not not with this group here working on the the issues, but I think the focus or attention that we want to bring from other stakeholders outside of this uh, group here. So, thank you. Thanks, Chief. Jeff. Yeah, I agree with uh, others that um, shorter and simpler is better. For a name, it's also sort of important to have a, a shortcut for the name. So I just throw one out um, that I was musing about, um, something like the Hate Prevention and Inclusion Policy Task Force, could call it HPIP. Um, you know, I think inclusion's important, obviously. We don't want to limit ourselves to just talking about hate crimes. So it's important to talk about hate prevention. But I think if we get too long, um, it confuses people and it makes it difficult to reference the recommendations of the committee or task force, I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Any other thoughts or comments? You know, hi, this I- is, uh, Hi, this- this is Anna DePello Garcia, uh, Stanford Healthcare. If I may, Cindy. Of course. Yes, uh, and just the various initiatives that we've done here, and and many of those initiatives that I've been involved with, creating names. Uh, it's what I was thinking through right now is what's intuitive. So I would agree, less is more, and what can convey and translate to whether you're an eighth grader, you're a professional, like emerging professional. What name? could be easily understood and easily trans, uh, translatable. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else? I'm looking around my screen. Nancy. Can I go? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have the raise hand function. No um, problem. Thank you for noting me. First, I wanna thank everybody who worked um, on this proposal uh, to come up with a new name. Um, but I, I do tend to agree with the, uh, the thread that we've heard in the last several comments, starting with Otto Lee, that um, you know we can, we can convey a lot, I think, through um, a phrase that is, that is short, but you know get, gets at everything everybody here is saying um, in terms of it, it hits you in your gut intuitively, and you know that even though it's short, it, it covers a lot. So I just wanted to um, thank the folks who worked on this and just say that I concur with these comments. Thank you. Um, before I go back to the group, um, I, I just want to make a couple of observations. First of all, um, I, I really, I agree with the, the extension of thanks to Mika and Kathy and Maha. Like, I, I actually think naming things is, is really one of the most difficult jobs I've had. I've named nonprofits. I, you know, I named my son. I mean, these all take, they, these are, and they're emotional, right? They're, you know, like you want to have the right name. Um, I, and I also just wanted to say that I think the most important work um, that you did in addition to bringing us the names was really the background and the framework for how you thought about this, because I think it really sets us up to be able to, um, uh, you know, to, to be mindful of the next step we take. And I think when, um, when we were coming up with the name for this group, Maya and I, you know, this was um, right after the, um, the, the uh, Gilroy, um, shootings and I and I think we were so focused on the the part of this that we could see and that really was the hate 
that was coming at the community. And so I really appreciate the, the um, you know, the, 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 the reordering and rethinking of words. And one thing that I would suggest, um, just I, I want to I want to try this out on folks, and if you could write it down just to see how this looks on, on paper. Um, but I was looking at the second one too, and I really like the task force on inclusion because this is all about belonging. Like if you think about the most important thing we want for our community, it's about belonging. So the task force on uh, inclusion and hate prevention. So I'll say that again, the task force on inclusion and hate prevention. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's really in response to what I've heard all of you, you just say. So I'm going to go around and uh, not, not just on mine, but if, if there's anything that jumps out, if someone wants to make a, a, um, a recommendation, this would be the time to do it. All right, so all right, so I'm going to go to Susan, Fawn, and then Maya, and then Jeff. I'd also like to thank people that put the effort into um, the, the uh, suggested names. I would just like to say that I think the uh, I like Cindy's uh, suggestion, and I think uh, using a word like multi-sector is not a good idea. I think that smacks of kind of bureaucracy, and most people on the street probably don't understand why you'd be saying that, so. Thank you, Fawn? Yeah, Supervisor Chavez, I, I like your recommendation. If I could just make a, just a, a recommendation to kind of flip it. So the attention is focused on hate and inclusion first, as opposed to task force. So we start out with hate prevention and inclusion task force. Thank you. Thanks. I'm just writing it down so I can look at it. Thank you. Uh, Greg? I like, um, I like your suggestion. I'd, I'd add uh, in response to the task force on inclusion and hate prevention and response. Uh, prevention is only Prevention is what's left out of our current name, but uh, wouldn't, want to, wouldn't want to leave response out of the new name either. Okay, thanks, Greg. Other thoughts that folks have? Maya? Uh, I just wanted to uh, throw my two cents in, which is I appreciate the um, inclusion and the hate prevention as well, um, and appreciate the work of folks um, doing this. Uh, you know, the name is hard, and, uh, and thank you for all your work on this and, and making this better. Um, and I also think simpler is better. And I wanted to ask, do you need a motion, um, or uh, are there mo more folks that have their hands raised that would like to provide input before we take some kind of action. Yeah, is there anybody else who would, thanks Maya. Let me just make sure if anybody has a thought that they wanna share, this would be the time to do it. I think names and mission statements are the most challenging, painful. And we're all nodding because we've all been through those meetings <laughs> where you think, oh my goodness, make it stop. Yeah. Um, anybody else? Nancy? Oh, Nancy, great. <laughs> That's okay. Thank I'm you. sorry. I keep having to no do that. No problem. That's okay. <laughs> I, I do really that. like uh, Chief No's idea of putting task force at the end um, so that the, the first words that make the impression are the more meaningful ones. Great. So uh, um, let me let me ask, um, is, is there anybody else on the task force? I'm going to go to the public next, and then I just want to see if there's anybody else on the task force. I see no hands, no waving. Okay, so let's go to the public and then I'll come back to all of you. We'll do uh, two minutes, I think. Our first speaker is Irvish. I've unmuted you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to uh, come in for the Hate Crime Task Force. And I wanted to thank the Board of Supervisors and as well as uh, 
the county council, all the advisors, uh, as well as uh, county sheriff, Lawrence Smith. Uh, what I wanted to mention about is uh, when we are establishing any policy ordinance for the hate crime policy within the county of Santa Cruz, it is important to know that what the state legislator is about and how the state legislator and the law commission of a county and as well as the state is connected with the different international culture and the countries. As it is very important that, that some of the hate crimes laws and as well as a cultural background that differs from a country to country. From the perspective of the countries in the Asian side, as well as the countries towards, uh, towards African and the European side, the law as well as the constitution differs from the American constitution and the law. So it is very important to establish and understand the specific purposes of having the hate crimes policies to be established and as well as knowing about the purpose of the background of the hate crime policy to be established and as well as knowing that you know what what must be what must be the what must be the causes of the culture to get involved in the Apologies, that was a misclick on my part. Thank you very much. So how the, those different cultures, you know, would be able to connect with the different international countries where the culture would ease the hate crimes and as well as allow the opportunity to establish the international policies at the county and the state level as well. Thank you. So um, thank you all. Is, so just to go back to the group here, here's what I would like to recommend. If Maya, if you, if you would like to put forward a motion and we'll get a second. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask everybody um, who's here to vote, like whether you're on the task force or not. I just wanna know, are we moving in the right direction? Cause I, I just think that's part of us, you know, working together. And so I, I know that's gonna be a little difficult for the clerk, um, but let's just, everybody who's on our screen who is, uh, you know, is here, I'd like to hear from you. Um, so Maya, do you wanna give us a name? Sure, so I hope I captured this correctly. So the uh, Inclusion and Hate Prevention Task Force, did I get that right? It, yeah, close. It, Chief know how to back the no, oh, sorry, hate prevention the and inclusion. Yeah. Hate prevention and inclusion task force. And so, did, and Chief, did you have a was your recommendation one? Do you prioritize one over the other for a reason or? Yeah, I you know um, not really. I I I think it's just mainly what Nancy said is that you know the focus is uh, hate prevention. You know and inclusion so i think um when people hear that word i think it it brings attention to it uh right away i mean inclusion because it's been used for other issues and causes also so it may be a little bit more diluted than what we're trying to accomplish here Got it. it's so the hate, same thing so hate prevention and inclusion uh, yeah. task force okay so maya does everybody have the motion maya you want to say it one last time just so we got it out of your mouth so the motion is to name the task force the Hate Prevention and Inclusion Task Force. That's the motion. Okay. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you. We have a second from um, Otto. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the um, the clerk if you could go through and just like I said, let's everybody who is uh, on the on our task force, whether they're voting members or okay, or so everybody. I believe so for the record we'll be taking a poll of the advisory members and it will not be recorded as a vote thank you um because the list jumps around unfortunately i'm going to go through everyone who was invited rather than yeah do what you need to do sorry thank Jess. you i kind of sprung it out on you okay angelica cortez Rabbi Hughes, Seed Valencia. Oh, wait, hold on one second. Angelica, I think, is trying to get off mute. So, Angelica, jump in there. Yes, thank you for reading my frantic facial expressions correctly, <laughs> Supervisor. Um, I'm sorry, I got a notice, so I didn't hear what the, the prompt or the question was on this particular piece. Uh, this is um, in support or not of the name, the Hate Prevention and Inclusion Task Force. 
support. Thank you. Thank you. Rabbi Hugh Seed Valencia. Support. Thank you. Kathy Wong. Support. Thank you. Tamil Gilkerson. Uh, Kathleen Rose. Kevin O'Brien. Someone's mic come on. Yeah, you're good. Keep going, Jess. Lily Arangio. Tony Williams. Gerald Sakamoto. Support. Support. Thank you. Nick Kuwata. Yes. Thank you. Ron Gonzalez. Sonia Tetnowski. Um, just for a moment, uh, Ron. Okay. Supervisor Chavez, go ahead. Oh, I'm just seeing if uh, Mayor Gonzalez took his self off mic. I, I thought he was going to vote. So go ahead, Sonia. Sorry about that. No problem. I support it. Sonia supports. No response from Ron Gonzalez. No. Milan Ballantin. <laughs> Ron, I hear you trying. Ron Gonzalez, I hear you trying, but we don't have your vote yet. I support. There you go. Thank you. We heard support. Milan Valentin. Kui Tron. Yes. All right. Thank you. Anna DePello Garcia. Yes. Sarah Fernando. Yes, I support. Thank you. Dante Lartique. I support. Thank you. Ruth Silvertaub. I support. Thank you. Adriana Caldera Barafis. I support. Thank you. Raimundo Amandaris. Susan Hayesi. Yes, I vote. Dolores Morales. Sarita Coley. Support. Rich Constantine. Margaret Abe Koga, Ash Kalra, Zoe Lofgren, Carrie Duncan, Port. Thank you, Carrie. Sandra Soto, Simeon Chen, Ahmad Thomas. Support. Thank you, Ahmad. Peter Larome Munoz, Leland Campbell. Support. Thank you, Leland. Michelle Mashburn. Support. Thank you, Michelle. Samina Usman. Mauricio Palma. Alicia Partee. Support. Thank you, Alicia. Virginia Jones. Mariko Sayok. Support. Thank you. Greg DeGier. Greg, I know you're on. I, I'll dissent and uh, just let me say why. Um, from the point of view of the disability community, there's a huge amount of hate and hate crimes, both uh, for which there's very little response uh, by either the law enforcement or on the civil side for su support. If by leaving out the word response, I think that will, uh, I, I, would, I would like to see the word response in all dissent. Thank you, Greg. Nervair Singh. Andres Cantero. Megan Sweeney Fogary. I'm in support. Thank you. That concludes the poll. Would you like to move to a vote of the members? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Chairperson Chavez? Yes. Chairperson Esparza? Yes. Member Lee? Yes. Member Boyarski? Yes. Member Lori Smith? Yes. 
Member O'Neill is absent. Member Jeff Smith? Yes. Member Narayan? Yes. Member No? Yes. Member Washburn is absent. Member Dewan? Yes. Member Armeline? Yes. Member Appel? Yes. Member Yeager? Yes. Member Estramera? Yes. Member El Giannotti? Yes. And Member Conda? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, really, let's give the committee a little round of applause. That took them a long time. That, those are hard to do. Really appreciate you and appreciate all of your feedback. Um, thank you. We're going to move now. Um, the way what will happen now is this name will go to the Board of Supervisors and uh, the board will have an opportunity to vote on that because this is a committee that was made up by the board. So thank you for that. Uh, between Otto and I, let's hope there's no big dissent at the board level. So we'll go to item four, and this is to receive a report from the Anti-Defamation League relating to online cyber hate tools, platforms, and trends, and recommendations for limiting online hate that contributes to the hate, crime, hate climate. And our a presenter is gonna be Lauren Kraft. And Lauren, are you with us? I thought I saw your- Hi there, I'm there here. There you go. All right, welcome. So I'm gonna turn this over to you. Great, looking forward. Let me just take a minute to share my screen. Um, hi everybody, thank you for having me. I am Lauren Krupp. I'm ADL's Council for Technology Policy and Advocacy. And um, you know, just like what was mentioned, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, the work that we're doing to fight online hate and harassment and um, some problems we're seeing and potential solutions that we're excited about. So bear with me. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So I'll just talk through this briefly and then really open up for questions and answer and hopefully be able to have a, a conversation. Um, I think many of you are familiar with the Anti-Defamation League, but you might not be familiar with uh, our deep work in fighting online hate and harassment. You might, but uh, for, for a review or for those of you who are less familiar, um, since the early days of the internet, ADL very quickly realized that where hate goes, um, people follow, and where people go, hate follow, follows. And um, in light of that, we leaned into our work, better understanding the ecosystem of online hate and figuring out the best ways that we could fight and push back against it. And so we reached out to tech platforms back in the days of AOL and Microsoft, and then um, moving forward to the Twitters and the Facebooks and the TikToks and the Zooms of the world um, and have really created and developed relationships um, and expertise and understanding in, in what, what this uh, environment looks like um, in relation to digital abuse and online harassment. In 2017, ADL launched our Center for Technology and Society and really leaned into the work of research and policy and product building in order to measure hate in real time, in order to see what are the trends related to online harassment and a push for advocacy and reform. So this is our third year in a row, um, putting out our annual online hate and harassment survey. Some of the 2021 numbers that I wanted to pull out and one of the linked uh, resources that you all should have, and I'm happy to also re-up, is the actual report, our 2021 report. But essentially, what our hypothesis, uh, you know, a couple of years ago when we started this report was, and unfortunately what we've seen year after year is that individuals are targeted online because of identity characteristics. So if you see here, um, the darker statistics are 2020 and the lighter ones are 2021. And we've broken this up. The question here is of respondents who were targets of harassment, how many of those respondents um, felt as if the harassment was related in some way, whole or in part to an identity characteristic. None of these are, um, we're concerned about the numbers regardless of whether they increase or decrease marginally from 2020 to 2021. And we're specifically concerned that there wasn't a significant decrease across the board because of the promises that platforms made historically this year. And when I say year, I'm, I'm talking really early 2020 into where we are now. Um, so let's say, you know, May 2020 to May 2021. 
we have not seen significant changes to the rates that individuals are experiencing harassment. Um, you, you see the numbers here. For the, These numbers, again, are um, individuals who faced harassment and then said that they attributed it to their identity. We have other statistics that I can point out regarding overall harassment that groups experienced. This was the third year in a row that LGBTQ plus individuals experienced the most harassment on the whole. This was the year with the largest increase in severe harassment amongst Asian respondents. So severe harassment we define as stalking, sexual harassment, physical threats, something beyond what might be protected speech. Um, and then where is harassment taking place? Of course, it's taking place uh, in email and in, in the dark corners of the internet, but what we found incredibly problematic is that harassment is taking place front and center. Three quarters of individuals who experienced some sort of harassment said they experienced it on Facebook. Right after that was Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So again, this is the front page of the, of the internet. This is not um, necessarily only taking place in dark web or in one-to-one uh, mediums like messaging. And again, like I mentioned, we, we were, we were uh, promised a lot from tech platforms in the early days of COVID to fight misinformation and in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and all of the hate and racism that we saw on, um, on the platform in light of the anti-Asian hate we saw in relation to uh, the coronavirus in light of all, all of these um, confluence of events, we were promised a lot from tech platforms. And unfortunately, we really haven't seen the movement that we deem necessary in order to really mitigate and fight online hate. And just to put that into perspective, you know, I think that we were hyper aware of the issue and the, and the impact of misinformation and hate online, but January 6th really solidified and concretized um, that idea that, again, we knew all too well, but I think it became um, more well understood that what happens online does not stay online and that the impact between online misinformation and hate has direct and violent effects from a one-to-one -one perspective, from a community perspective, and um, for our democracy. And so, you know, I'm, I'm naming here some of the, you know, in, our, in the bullet, some of the pieces that contributed to the lead up to the insurrection of the Capitol, the spread of electoral misinformation, the amplification of hate and racism and extremism, um, platforms recommending individuals to join extremist groups. There has been consistent research and one particular report um, that came out of Germany in 2016, and we've been tracking ever since. Unfortunately, it's really hard to get internal data, but that report said that 64% of individuals who joined extremist groups joined them because of Facebook's recommendations. So we know that the platforms have a really big role to play here. Um, you know, ADL has said that the, the insurrection at the Capitol was the most predictable terror attack in American history again, because it was planned out in the open on social media. Um, and that not only was planned there, but again, was also hosting hate and harassment um, and, and other forms of digital abuse. So the result, um, as some of you may have followed, but others may have not, I would imagine most folks here you know, are aware that Facebook um, and other big tech platforms removed uh, then President Trump from their platforms. Facebook's decision was indefinite and recently came out deciding that they would uh, only remove Trump's account for uh, two years until January, 2023. Um, ADL and some other organizations are really concerned about this because um, the idea that inciting an insurrection would not be enough to remove someone from a platform and, and knowing that the research that when um, highly influential individuals who are uh, spewing hate and threats and violence are removed, that uh, the spreading of that does decrease. Again, we were, we were really concerned about that decision. Um, but of course, the answer we, we often grapple with because we, we really value civil rights and civil liberties and understand the importance to protect speech is what about the First Amendment? And that is why we really take care in walking the line and understanding the nuance between what is protected online and what isn't and are advocating for a more detailed and careful approach between parsing out just that. What is conduct online? What is speech that's protected online? And what is unprotected speech? You know, moving threats, uh, violence, incitement. Um, so, you know, 
a lot of our, our advocacy work, specifically our work uh, to introduce anti-swatting and anti-doxing and anti-cyber harassment bills um, in states across the country is developing language that walks this line. Now, looping back to Facebook, of course, um, th that is a private company, Twitter is a private company. We do think that uh, tech platforms should be you know, robustly enforcing their own content moderation policies. Uh, but when it comes to changing law and policy, we were really cognizant and careful in order to protect speech um, that, that should be protected. The, the, I'll, I have you know one more minute or so of presentation that I really want to get into discussion, but the issues that we're seeing online aren't just content moderation or some of you may be familiar with Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, you know, platform liability. These, these uh, issues are part of a bigger picture. And so we're also trying to work with others in the community to ensure that we're looking at this from a multifaceted approach what is contributing to hate and racism and violence online. And it really is a confluence of product and policies. You know, like I said, the platforms have been um, increasing or strengthening policies, but that's not influential without adequate enforcement, enforcement at scale. Uh, we just saw a big antitrust package introduced in the House of Representatives. That really is getting at the, the issue of the anti-competitive marketplace and how that breeds complacency for platforms, the normalization of extremism, the issues of privacy, privacy and surveillance, like I was talking about earlier, the state of harassment and digital abuse, and then of course parsing out the difference between protected speech, um, protected disinformation even, and unprotected categories of speech. The benefits of, um, of an open and free internet are important, and knowing that organizing and innovation, education and worship speech and exchange, especially after this last year um, where we relied in light of the coronavirus uh, on digital spaces in order to maintain daily life, we understand those benefits really clearly. And that's why taking this seriously and looking critically and thoughtfully about what types of reform measures um, are most impactful and what ones might overcorrect are really, really, really important in order to adequately fight online hate. So ADL recently launched our repair plan, our six prong uh, strategy, or, or really essentially putting together um, or putting forward priorities that we deem necessary from the industry, from civil society, from government and from other uh, advocates, advocates to push back and push hate and extremism to the fringes of the digital world. I won't name them all here. Repair is an acronym. Each letter stands for a different priority. But I will tell you that we're working on stuff here in California. Uh, one bill that I'll mention before turning it over to Q&A is AB 587, our social media transparency bill that's being championed by Assemblymember Jesse Gabriel. Uh, it's currently passed the Assembly and is in the Senate right now. And that bill carefully looks at um, the the ways in which we can compel better transparency from social media platforms in order to see how they're moderating their content, what is being left up on the platforms, what is being taken down uh, that shouldn't be, and understanding the impact on individuals um, that, you know, that complacency essentially and that letting misinformation, hate, racism, harassment proliferate, what is that impact? So I'm gonna stop sharing here and move to questions. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to, I think you all have this slide, but I'm also happy to, um, to uh, resend it around. I see some hands. Should I just do Q and A? Is somebody gonna facilitate? I'm happy to just call. Yeah, I'll do that, Lauren, thanks. So uh, we'll start with Greg and then we'll go to Michelle. Uh, thank you for all, all, this, all this work, particularly, um, I was particularly interested in the statistics in the first slide about online hate and harassment. Um, I noticed that disability and homelessness are not categories there. Um, is, is that beca uh, because the, the question that was asked that, that produced this data didn't include those or were, or were, was it an open-ended question that uh, people just didn't, you, you didn't, you didn't give them a list of things. You just said, have you been harassed for any reason? And then they tell you what the reason was. 
Yeah, it's a great question. So we did a nationally representative survey and we did ask those specific categories. Um, we did that because of, I think, the ability to um, get at the federally protected categories. And I know that disability is one of them. And, and, and I know that homelessness is also one that we're trying to seek more data on. But in light of the state of online harassment, specifically in the ties to um, race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, in our first couple of years, we honed in on that. We're looking to expand. In fact, we're looking to expand to youth. Um, and also, I think that the categories that you mentioned, disability and homelessness, are ones that, um, that we think about. I, I will say with homelessness, I think access to um, hate and you know, the, the internet and hate and harassment is one that would be really interesting to explore and see the ways that that proliferates as well uniquely. Um, so I think it's a good flag. We did ask those questions specifically. And, and the other question is uh, concerning the anti-male. Uh, uh, do you have any way of knowing it was any way to disaggregate that, that data like what did like does specifically does that include anti-transgender women i'm sorry well, can you ask that again the anti-male uh, anti-female you're, you're oh, okay you're i misheard you um so the the way in which we conduct this survey and i have to say if we had more data which i wish we did from a from a government and law enforcement perspective we might be able to uh, compare better is that individuals answer the question, um, you know, self-reporting. So mm -hmm. if an individual felt that they were harassed in a certain category based on their own identity, whatever it is that they determined it to be, of course, vetting, you know, we work closely with, um, with YouGov, which is, you know, one of the uh, respected uh, survey uh, companies in, in the U.S., but we did allow individuals to respond based on their own um, self-reporting. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Michelle? Similar to what Greg brought up, um, disability is like it's a daily thing in social media for the hate to be spouted and accepted. That's the two part piece of it. It is disappointing. And I did a deep dive in the report to try to see how much disability was even represented in the materials you were putting forward. I'm not surprised at the lack of it. There was one page that did list disability as 12% of something. I can't really recall completely what, but um, it's a daily thing. Youth with disabilities especially have bullying and other things that go on via social media and online platforms. And I think to omit that is, while I understand the difficulties in, in compiling that information, but to omit that from this type of report shows another version of compliance with the ongoing sediments in our society. And um, my question would be kind of what is your organization doing to create kind of a better way to measure those demographics? And I realize you're also up against a barrier in the state of California where a lot of those demographics are not collected. So that would be my question. I think that's a great question. And Michelle, I think that's an issue that we are experiencing certainly um, you know, in the with the with disability rights in the disability community, and also across the board related to hate and identity characteristics, is we are lacking data. I think you bring up a great point, uh, both on the need to hone in on it further. We do collect some statistics, uh, but in order to engage deeper, is is something that's very very important. I know that we look into that um, as far as it relates to public accommodations, certainly uh, in online spaces. There's some protections for individuals with disabilities, but not enough. Uh, hate and harassment is absolutely one that that um, that that should have more emphasis as well. We we are we're really looking right now into public accommodations and what that looks like in online spaces, especially I, I see you know especially related to individuals with disabilities, which is not great. But we need more reporting, and and we can do self-reporting, and we we can certainly do more. But we also need way way better and more compliant. Um, municipalities, state governments, and, and the federal government with this as well. I really, really appreciate your comments. Thank you. Maha? Um, thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to Lauren. I think what she just presented is excellent work, and, and thank you especially for your work on regulation. The, uh, the results that you reported on by identity uh, respondents, I wanted to know if it included hate happening only in the United States or hate around the world? 
because it's a, a particular problem, obviously, for Muslims in certain regions in the world. And uh, and does the bill you mentioned, uh, and you did this very fast, so please forgive me yes, if, I, if, if my question doesn't make any sense, but does the bill you mentioned reveal the sources of hate in order to help prevent it? And then finally, um, in full disclosure, I'm actually one of the faith advisors um, uh, to Facebook, and you know I'm with Jewish, Hindu, uh, Buddhist Christians, and we're all very concerned about our role, and we don't know whether we're going to continue that role or not. Mm. But is, is there any work, um, uh, any work that you're doing around um, education to prevent hate? And I, I ask this because uh, this is something that I've really, um, you know, asked Facebook about to support uh, organizations such as ours that are that are doing work on hate prevention. Um, and like Google gives, uh, you know, credits to nonprofits, uh, Facebook hasn't done that. And it really annoys me to death that uh, there's all this hate that's happening on Facebook, but yet they're not doing anything to counter it. So um, I'll stop there. You and me both. Yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate all those. Let me get at as many as I remember, and you can always uh, chime in. And additionally, I'm happy to talk offline further about this. I think you bring up a lot of really good points. As far as global goes, for this particular report, we've been capturing the American experience related to online hate and harassment. We are tracking incidents globally, but not from a quantitative perspective yet. We do work closely with Avaz, who does a lot of that good work, as well as other organizations in the technology, policy, civil rights, human rights community. Um, but this particular report is the American experience, and I completely agree with you. It's only one piece to the puzzle. We think it's an important one to track, but it's certainly only one piece. Regarding the a bill that we're working on, AB 587, that would have a global impact in understanding um, content moderation practices across the board. So in, in order to see, it's interesting, the devil's in the details, so we'll have to see how things shake out, but essentially a bill passed here would compel platforms to produce information regarding content moderation practices writ large related to their um, related to their um, uh, content moderation policies. I think we have a shared screen here. I'm not sure. Yeah, Otto, your screen is shared with us right now. Thank you. So, so. Um, the bill highlights five specific areas of content moderation, extremism, foreign interference, hate and racism, harassment and disinformation, misinformation. And it would require the platforms to, to show us a little bit more if they have a policy in that space about what's changed with the policy, what's the prevalence of the content that is on the platform, if they take it down, if they don't, for how long. So we get a lot better information as to how they're really dealing with these type, this type of content on the platform. Um, and, and that would include all classes that they protect. So, you know, calling back to that would get us more information regarding um, individuals who experience hate and harassment related to disability, related to religion, race, and so on and so forth. As far as the faith advisory goes um, and our work in the education space, you know, ADL does a lot of work related to um, hate and bias prevention in the education space. and. One of my personal goals, and hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll uh, wrangle Nancy into this with me, is doing um, doing more specifically related to online hate prevention, digital and media literacy, social listening, some of these really important tools that both I think um, young people and not you know and not too young folks can really benefit from. So that's actually one of my personal goals, and I'm I'm you know really leading a lot of ADL's future work with tech policy. So I'm hoping that I get support for that. Thanks. Well, I'm wondering whether our committee could actually help if uh, if Cindy and, and Otto and and other important people here could, uh, you know, could join you in a conversation with the executives of Facebook, you know, Zuckerberg and, and Sandberg and others. Um, I, you know, that may actually help uh, influence the right here in our area. And I think that we can potentially influence this. So just keep that. That's up. great. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's certainly talk offline about that. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. Um, are there any other comments or feedback from my colleagues? I see none. So let me just um, uh, see if, um, or just ask for any of you to, or make a recommendation. 
I know that there's a lot of work to be done. I think this was a really helpful presentation. I have to say the thing that was most surprising to me is I do think I thought a lot of the, the, um, the hate radicalization was happening in the dark web. I didn't really, it was just on, you know, so easy to access and it explains why so many um, folks are really engaged in this, this activity. Um, and so one thing that we're gonna talk about colleagues next is um, how we break up into working groups. And I, and I actually think that the online work is gonna require a lot more, um, a kind of a deeper dive. And I'm gonna recommend that be one of our stakeholder groups. And I, I also uh, really appreciate, Maha, your recommendation about work that can be done concurrent. And, and I, I will just say to all of you, I, I recognize that there's a, an awful lot of activities that we're gonna be engaging in. And some of them will be happening concurrently because there's bills and other activities moving forward. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one comment from the public and then what I think we can do is fold this um, item into the next item that we're going to talk about. And Lauren, I, wa I want to just say a very sincere thank you for the amazing uh, work that you've been doing, not just, um, I mean, both in, in cyber harassment initiatives, but the work that you're doing in, in the legal field uh, and all the appellate briefs and just all the smart ways you're trying to protect people in our community. So thank you for that. Um, so we'll go Thanks to our public speaker. Me. Oh, you bet. We'll go to our public speaker and then uh, see if there are any other comments. Our speaker is Irvish. <clears throat> You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to mention about specifically uh, uh, the technology counselor uh, Lawrence presentation on the on the online and as well as this. Uh, in most of the circumstances, uh, it has been brought to the attention that the hate crimes happening over the online platform that has been this that has been under the scrutiny for a longer uh, period of time as the, what the hate crimes and the purpose of happening the hate crimes has always been uh, remained to be uh, remain to be hard to investigate uh, as well as knowing the cause of investigation and the cause and the purpose of uh, such uh, 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 such uh, 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 such activity to be transpired with the online platform. In a such case that, uh, uh, that the county must accomplish uh, information literacy commission along with, the, uh, along with the judicial system for the online platform to identify and place uh, uh, a, a policy to be placed in order to rectify that, you know, what are the right steps to be taken in order to prevent the hate crimes over the online platform, as well as knowing the repercussion of, as well as the repercussion causes, uh, uh, consequences and effects of such, as having those be known and having those platform be known over the technology platform and online services and a social media, it is important to to be aware that you know how those crimes are being uh, being performed without the identity being anonymous and as well as utilizing those technology as being the pros and cons of those technology. I request the hate, hate crime force to establish the information literacy commission along with the hate crime, hate crime task force to identify those. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna come back to the board and just say again, uh, a very special thank you to Lauren and that I look forward to our work dovetailing with her. Um, and if we can, I, it, uh, colleagues, I'd like to move on to item five, because this is where we're going to do a little, a little brainstorming. Um, so item five is an update from me relating to the referral, um, asking for professional and expert assistance to the hate crimes task force that Supervisor Lee and I brought forward to our colleagues on June 22nd. The, um, the referral was approved and administration will return to the board of supervisors on August 17th with options for contracting with San Jose State um, and information relating to possible collaboration with other academic institutions and the referral is attached for your reference. And really um, given the breadth of the recommendations and next steps needed, I think you know we, we really realize that we're gonna need some outside support to help us with our stakeholder work groups do analysis it's going to have to happen very quickly because both um, 
Supervisor Lee and I and Council Member Esparza are very interested in bringing recommendations to our boards before the end of this year. And uh, so we're gonna dive in and you know start getting everybody uh, to work. We're gonna coordinate with these stakeholders um, so that we can get the knowledge research and analysis and also recognizing that for many of you, the work that you do in the community brings you in contact with other folks who could be really helping us dive in on very particular issues. Um, so the, the body of this work will include all of the analysis I just talked about, making sure that this board has a chance to have a, a body of recommendations that you feel comfortable with. By the way, I think some will be geared toward the county, some the city, some maybe the private sector, you know, as we just discussed, Facebook. So we're gonna we're gonna really try to see if we can't get you all to pick a group that you want to press, work on, roll up your sleeves, so that we can get these recommendations out to the or the uh, entities that they're most appropriate to go to. So um, the goal here is to uh, let me just see. That's kind of our overall approach. Let me just see if Otto, if you wanted to add anything. To what I just said. No, thank you very much, Cindy. I think you really did cover everything that uh, we put together on this, and thank you so much for your leadership on it. And uh, happy to uh, see the uh, the moving this forward. But I, I I'm very glad to see how this is uh, looking at, and I think it's a really awesome uh, move that we are putting something, you know, action to words. And uh, I, I really do see that uh, this is, uh, and I really do think that whatever recommendation come through, if we could actually get to the, the stakeholders, like, you know, is this Facebook, is it uh, those uh, social media uh, organization, I think coming from, from the board, uh, from the task force, I think it should be something that they would uh, recognize and, and take action on. Thank you. Thanks, Otto. Um, Maya, is there anything you wanted to add? I just wanted to thank you and Otto for your leadership and thank San Jose State. Um, uh, I know we haven't formalized this, but uh, this is the work that we're all so eager to get to. Um, and this is an important step to provide support to diving in. Thanks. Thank you. What I, what I wanted to do is see if there are any questions from my colleagues just about the general approach. And then I want to come back and talk about it just to brainstorm a little bit with you about what what are the categories of stakeholder groups that we'd like to develop just so that we can start putting those um, in play as we develop these, um, you know, further develop these contracts. Um, so any questions just about the, the referral itself? If, if uh, Michelle? Sorry, I was trying to figure out which section I wanted to include this. In the referral and, and specifically kind of with San Jose State in general, um, there's been an ongoing process for myself of trying to get stats of disability included in a lot of what gets put forward. And the answer is we don't have access to those stats or those statistics overall. So I really want to hear about, around disability specifically. So I want to make sure that disability representation is clear in this referral and in the ask with whoever you contract with to make sure that we're getting a qualified entity to actually address those the demographic of people with disabilities within Santa Clara County. Okay. Yeah, and Michelle, I think that's an excellent point. And um, I, I, I'll just, I'll say that we um, will take responsibility, both myself and Otto, if I could speak for Otto, we'll take responsibility for making sure that's the case in these contracts. So thank you for raising that. And also, Michelle, one thing that I would also say is that, um, you know, I, I'd be very interested to in in understanding if there are organizations or institutions that you think we should be including uh, in these contracts that maybe we're not. So, you know, get that back to us. So thank you for that. Any other questions about the the money we set aside? We, we, we set aside a couple, $250,000 and not to exceed in, in terms of research and expenditures. So um, now here's a question for all of you. We've been talking about this. I know you've been thinking about it. Are there stakeholder groups, like topics that you want us to make sure we're, that we're prioritizing? An example of that would be what we just heard. I, I'm gonna assume we're gonna wanna do something on cyber hate. That's just such a big category. And there's a lot to that. But that to me would be a, a definite stakeholder group. But are there other issues that you want to make sure we dive deep into so we can make recommendations? Susan? 
Um, I think there's a lot of uh, intersection between uh, hate incidents and uh, people who have unaddressed mental health concerns and um, who are uh, have fallen through the social safety net. And so I'd like to see some effort put into that. Okay. Yeah, and just brainstorm with us. We'll shape it later, you guys. We just, we want to be able to hear from, from you. We, and then Maya. Sure. Um, there has been a lot of conversation around uh, critical race theory and, and how it promotes um, I guess an anti-white uh, perspective, uh, or makes people feel that you know just by by virtue of color of your skin that you are a racist, and I think that's a big misconception, and actually contributes to a lot of the aggressive conversations around race. Um, I don't know if this is more of a county board's uh, role or not, but I, I would appreciate a conversation on this issue as well. Great, thank you, Maya, and then I'll come to you, Anna. So, um, so I wanted to look at the uh, issues that the task force is ta tasked with um, is, for example, um, the hate speech component of it, um, the gender based hate crimes. I, I suspect that the gender based is a whole um, complex issue. Um, and then um, there's the component about the illegal gun trade. Um, and then the school component. And I think each one of those are pretty deep areas. And so I wanted to bring those up because uh, I think we need to figure out how we're gonna get from here to there. Yep, well said, thanks, Maya. Kathy, oh, I'm sorry, Anna, and then I'll come back to you, Kathy. Oh, thank you. Just curious about where the life cycle begins for hate crimes prevention. And I know we have Marianne here. Um, you know, do we have an opportunity or an influence, or maybe it's already, there is a strategy on where do we begin shaping minds around these issues? If, if there is that opportunity within the school systems, maybe it's there already and I simply don't know. Thanks, Anna. And we're just, you guys, we're gonna, we're gonna just take a list right now and then we're gonna shape these up with our, um, with our contract provider and bring them back to you in August. Uh, Kathy. Yes, I think following on Anna's comments, um, I, and, and also all the, the high profile hate incidents like that have occurred in Colleen Gilroy and other places. I, I guess I'm wondering if we should, if, if we could have like um, arenas of how institutions, like whether it's in the private sector, in the workplace or in education, how do they handle low level incidents? Like how, you know, we, we often hear that there are um, you know, situations with an individual that people sort of saw the writing on the wall, this person has been you know, making horrible comments or targeted people or those kind of things. And I feel like institutions are unable to handle those and or collect data and track those or even know what to do with that, right? Because of fears of First Amendment, all these other things that I think that were really well brought up for the online context. But I think similar to online context, we have similar sorts of arenas of interaction, I think that are really important to examine, so. Thanks, Kathy. Ruth? Uh, yes, um, I'd like to also have a focus on uh, harassment or hate in the workplace. And I know last night at my class, I covered that and I had a speaker from the EOC and she has a chart of the uh, harassment discrimination uh, issues that have come up or claims that have come up in the last year. Specifically, harassment uh, would be good. The DFVH would also have that. I know um, maybe on our advice line, we ought to start tracking that as well. And I know at the Law Center, I have the memos too, and I can go through them and look at that. But I think uh, the workplace is important uh, as well to focus on. And I agree about disability. I think that's uh, very important, especially during COVID too, when people were regarded as disabled even after their quarantine, we got a lot of calls on that. Oh, thanks Ruth. Greg? Uh, yeah, um, disability and, and gender have been mentioned. Um, and I think each of them has particular 
uh, problems that, that are uh, maybe not common to, to hate crimes and hate incidents in general. So I hope we can take a look at those two in particular. Um, uh, Anti-indigenous uh, hate crimes and hate incidents, they're over, often overlooked. Uh, I, for example, when I started talking today, completely forgot about it and didn't mention it. So I think that's, that's, a, that's one to look at. Um, I think uh, the question of uh, law enforcement officers' attitudes, whether how, how seriously they take any of these, uh, these categories of, of hate crimes and hate incidents is something we need to look at too. Thanks, Greg. Sarita? Yeah, I think much of um, what I wanted to say has been covered, I think, with other people, but I think there should be a special focus on youth, particularly, and whether that's in the school settings or something, there's a, just a different way in which young people process these things as opposed to adults, and so just having a work group or something separately for youth. Thanks, Sarita. Fawn? Yeah, I would agree with Greg that um, there needs to have a component with law enforcement. And uh, one of the things that I would be interested in is looking at modernizing the diversity training that law enforcement personnel are currently receiving. And so you have two components. Uh, the first one is uh, recruit officers when they're first hired, right? We complete a background on them and we think they're suitable to be police officers. We send them to police academies and POST has... Uh, uh, learning domains uh, currently that are required for police recruits at academy. And there's a very small section uh, on uh, crisis intervention all lumped in together with uh, diversity training. And I just browsed through what is currently being trained. I think uh, POST, which is a Peace Officer Standards and Training, a regulatory agency from the state that regulates you know, what we train our officers on, I think there's an opportunity to enhance what's currently being provided at training at post. And I know that's gonna uh, require more hours, but I think uh, it's worth a conversation for us as a group to look at and perhaps uh, make some recommendations down the road. Um, the other piece yes. of it is, you know, it has to be continual training also. So we're training the recruit officers when they first get hired, but what about the officers? Uh, that have not gone through that training in post. And so we have to have something in there with the, uh, the annual training that we're going to provide. And I'll end it with just one observation. You know, over the years, you know, law enforcement uh, has provided diversity training. But from my perspective, that training um, is from sort of like a lens of let's learn about this particular group. Let's learn about the Black community. Let's learn about the Asian community. And what that sets is, is sort of like a perspective, but we're learning about them as opposed to, I think it should be flipped about, we're learning about us. We're learning about what this country is all about, right? And so it's not like, there's no separation between the person learning about the culture uh, that is different from them as something that is unique, alien, different, but it's, it's about learning about our history, the history of our country. And so that should be the learning sort of like concept that we should switch to as opposed to, oh, we're learning about this exotic culture and we're trying to understand them. No, 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 no. This quote unquote exotic culture is America. This mm -hmm. is us. And so I think if we change what we've been training law enforcement personnel, on over the years, I think it may have an impact because it's not about us learning about them. It's about us learning about us. Mm -hmm. It's it's a we thing. Uh, so I think it's it's worth revisiting or visiting what is currently being trained or provided at post and what we're training law enforcement personnel. And uh, just a disclaimer, I haven't had a chance to talk to my fellow uh, county police chiefs yet. This is just a just an opinion from from one chief that's it. But I I think it's a it's an area that is worth for us to focus on uh, and, and what are we doing uh, when we expose our officers to diversity, right? Uh, so that there's more recognition of it's, it's us. It's not, oh, we're learning about other people. Cindy, can I just uh, jump in? Can I jump in just to comment on this? Okay. I just wanted to say that uh, what was just recommended is something that doesn't have to wait for a post. I think the county can make those recommendations to the police departments in the county. So uh, the board of supervisors, you know, led by you and and uh, and, and Otto, 
could uh, potentially make that recommendation. And then you have the skilled people in this room that could put a training like that together uh, because it would be related to what was mentioned earlier by Susan and others about CRT, which I think needs to be absolutely included in that sort of training. And we could put together something like a two to three hour training, which doesn't necessarily require post um, approval. So I just wanna throw that out there as one of the things that the county could do. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. I mean, one thing, that's, one that's thing I great. wanted to say, you guys, is I just want to brainstorm right now, and I, there are a lot of other folks who want to weigh in. So that we're really just designing the stakeholder groups. But I appreciate both Fawn and Maha and the, and the urgency that you're saying. Get moving. We, I hear you. Thank you. Megan and then Susan. Um, I just wanted to offer up as, as topics and reaffirm some topics that have been raised, but also some connections to research at Stanford, if it might be helpful as those groups go forward. One is there's a cyber policy center that works on internet policy, um, so that might be useful. And also the whole uh, issue that's been raised around youth literacy and the how do we develop um, our civic capabilities to look at fact or fiction on the internet. And there's a group at the School of Education that has some research on that. If that could be helpful, I'm happy to connect. That's great. Thank you. Susan? Um, yes, I'd like to um, urge a focus be put on supporting and um, assistance to uh, communities, both specific communities and also the community at large um, who are organizing. Uh, to address hate in terms of both response to it as well as understanding it better in order to address it um, in different policies. So uh, one example would be uh, bystander training. My organization has uh, sponsored a bystander training. I know many other communities have done that, and I think it's been found to be extremely helpful in terms of empowering people um, and uh, getting people to really understand what's going on. Thank you. Reverend Sakamoto? I think you know, we have, uh, we're thinking about what we can do to moderate or to correct uh, uh, or address uh, hate crimes. But I think we also need to look at where these come from. And it's not just, and so what you're speaking about in the, in the uh, police department or police organization, looking at where these, where these come from. And it's not just, um, it's to re-educate uh, re ourselves to look at um, each other, not as some exotic <laughs> group, but as us, that this is, this is us and we're learning about us. And I think that shifting that paradigm uh, is, is going to be very important. And that can then take place in our education system. It can take place in our civic organizations, uh, our public organizations. It's a changing of the way that we see ourselves, not as others. And I think we talked about this before, but but as, as, a, as a group, how do we address this? And so it's re-educating re ourselves. Um, uh, and in the very earliest uh, uh, experiences, uh, we can change that. And I think the, the, someone mentioned earlier about uh, mental health issues. I think it was Susan, uh, that these things are kind of being falling through the cracks uh, in uh, the unsheltered population. Uh, they may not be really, uh, what is it, uh, kind of stand out when we think about hate crimes, but uh, there are, uh, they receive that and they're a part of that and they also kind of contribute to it, but how are they, their needs being taken care of? And I think uh, that's a real important part of our, uh, what we do as a, as a community. If we are unable to address the needs of a significant part of our community, then we are already acting in a way that uh, sets us up for thinking in terms of me, what I want, and the other, and what they might need, but I can't deal with. So <laughs> it kind of divides us up. But it, it's the idea of trying to bring us together uh, as we address um, uh, what is occurring within our communities. So education one, and then the other, uh, the unsheltered. Thank you. Michelle? Um to echo the unhoused population is is an area of great um, incidence. I I feel of hate, as well as if it would be great to be able to do a history of hate of Santa Clara County, and to compile it kind of in one full report that starts to address 
the historic um, racism, sexism, um, homophobia, and all of those things within our communities, the immigrant, and so on. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Ruth? Yes, um, I, I wanted to follow up on what Chief No said. I, uh, with Reverend Moore, saw the post training on hate. And I just want to say on the plus side, the DV1 and HT were good. The hate was both of us agreed that it was one of the more superficial trainings. It just showed into three individuals walking up. It was very short. And as contrasted with the other two, um, it was pretty bad. And so I really think it has to be reworked and rethought because it's really important that law enforcement understands this issue. Thanks, Ruth. Greg? Um, one way to get at the, the tension uh, that, that we've, we've talked about some already between a uh, law enforcement approach to hate crimes or the criminal justice approach to hate crimes and alternative approaches uh, might be um, Stanford Law and the Brennan Center just like last month issued what I thought was a very, very good report that focused on that and didn't um, didn't take any uh, strong, uh, you know, ideological stand one way or the other, but looked at what the, the real issues are and what, what might be done. Starting, okay. starting with their report might be a good way to get at that issue. Thanks, Greg. Kathy, you will have the last idea here. Okay. Um, I, I, I think that it would be good to have a stakeholder group that looks at what, what are, you know, what is the, what is the research? What are successful things on, on building regional capacity to do the type of work I think that's necessary to prevent hate. So, you know, um, uh, at, uh, at San Jose State and at other universities and in my area, there is a lot of work, uh, compelling work on intergroup um, dialogue work, which is based in um, a critical race social justice education framework in which you actually um, engage people from groups that have very you know, conflicting problems, but in very um, facilitated ways so that you can get at understanding our own, all of our relationship to historical inequities, right? And whether people come kicking and screaming, there are, there are methodologies and ways in which you engage people that um, based in social psychology that actually work um, and they produce good intergroup leadership facilitative skills as well. Um, and there's been some, some good research that's showing that it's, it changes um, the framing of how people understand what they don't know, which is really important. I think that's probably one of the most important things. And so, so I would like to see a group on, on how to build capacity among the county, among schools, among companies, or you know, among public officials and, and people who work in communities and different organizations. Um, if there's some sort of like, you know, I don't know, uh, hate prevention, you know, I don't know, dialogue core or something like that. I think that would really help um, so that people can also have a sharper eye at looking at systemic inequity, which I think is, is the root of a lot of the issues. So. Thank you. Yeah. So let me just talk a little bit about next steps. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take both the, you know, back to the point that Maya raised, like what was the core, what is our core mission, and then frame out some stakeholder um, uh, work groups that, I mean, I'm sorry, stakeholder groups, and um, and we'll send those out to you at least a week before the next meeting so that you have a chance to look at the, both the, the group, uh, I'm sorry, the stakeholder team um, name, and then the descriptor underneath it. We're also going to then have to prioritize them because to get to our December date, you know, it doesn't mean that we can't keep doing work, but really to prioritize those that we um, that we can and match those with partner organizations that are going to help us do the, the, uh, this body of work. So it's a lot of um, work that we're going to be asking our contract partners to help us get through. Now, a number of you um, raised something else that I just frankly hadn't anticipated. I didn't think enough ab about this, but I think it's a really great point is that um, you've all, all raised where there may be resources available in, within your institutions that, you know, some work that's already done, you know, some things that we don't have to rebuild. I want to make sure that um, that those get sent to Kathy. Uh, we took notes today, but if there are particular, like I think Greg's point about particular reports or 
um, institutions that we should connect with. I really want to make sure we get those resources so that whatever stakeholder group has that topic can work directly with the um, institutions that are experts in those areas. Uh, and so um, this, you know, one thing I, I may do, um, Maya, with, uh, with your um, concurrence is perhaps um, working with our, our main contractors is just pull a few of you who want to help shape some of the, the stakeholder groups, because this was a really good, great list, but just to make sure we're we really responded to what people have heard. I mean, what we heard from all of you that we're being responsive and, and also that we're really able to, to deal with the fact that the, you know, not to use the word that is not in our title, but this, the multi-sectoral approach is gonna be really important. And I also think there's a, a private sector, public sector role that I think uh, that, well, you know, that um, Lauren talked about that Maha reinforced, you know, so anyway, there's some stuff we wanna take a deeper dive at. If you're interested in volunteering, so I don't have to voluntold you, um, send me or Kathy a quick note and we will uh, put you on our you know, brainstorming just to walk through um, and shape what we talked about today. Does that sound okay as next steps for everyone? That we can do that? Okay. Um, that was really good. That was really, really helpful. Well, with that, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna adjourn now and I'm gonna just uh, remind everybody that we're gonna meet on the 27th of August at 12. Um, we're going to have a lot of work that we have to get done before then, because at that time, what I want to do is just um, introduce the stakeholder groups. And I'm going to really ask if folks can, if they have concerns about um, any topic or they want to add in, if they wouldn't mind just communicating with us before the meeting. I, and we'll get the information out as early as we can. Uh, Greg, in particular, I wanted to say how much I appreciate getting people's notes beforehand, because it really makes us think about our work. So I'm just really grateful to all of you for doing that. And um, I thanks um, for all of your time, your energy, your effort, and I will look forward to seeing you hopefully before August 27th at noon and um, volunteer or I will find you anyway. So everybody have a good rest of your day and I hope people get a little vacation before I see you. Thanks all, be well. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Recording stopped. Thanks all. Bye-bye.